Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. My name is Catherine Multari. I am a naturopathic physician practicing in beautiful Port Moody, British Columbia. I am a second year naturopathic oncology resident interested in working with cancer patients. And that's led me, originally I'm from Ontario, but that's brought me all the way out here. Tonight, I am excited to talk about a topic that affects many of us, which is cancer-related fatigue. So everyone joining today is either showing up for themselves or showing up for somebody that they care for, a loved one. Um, and whoever you're showing up for, I want you to raise your hand now if that person you're showing up for, whether it's yourself or someone else, has experienced some level of fatigue, level of fatigue during, during cancer, cancer or cancer um, treatment. Okay, so I'm seeing some hands there. So cancer and cancer treatment, the most common side effect of both are actually fatigue. So, so fatigue is something that hits home for many, many cancer patients and their families, all affected. And today we're gonna learn some strategies to help um, mitigate that side effect. So the goals of tonight's webinar, we want to first understand the why, knowing why um, a patient has fatigue helps us to come up with appropriate treatment plans. And also knowing the why will help us better understand why sometimes just getting a good night's sleep may not be enough. There are many comorbidities within the cancer population. Insomnia, anxiety, and depression are very common ones that we see a lot in the cancer patient. Fatigue can be a trigger for all three of those. So insomnia, anxiety, and depression we will hit on throughout the course of this presentation. Okay, so getting into what exactly is, is this specific type of fatigue in the cancer population, the American Society of Clinical Oncology defines cancer-related fatigue as a distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, and or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related to cancer and or cancer treatment that is not proportional to recent activity and interferes with usual functioning. So this type of fatigue, as it says, it doesn't have to be just physical. It can be emotional fatigue as well, and it's not proportional to physical um, output. And also this fatigue involves a vicious cycle of reduced physical activity, avoidance behaviors, helplessness, and depressed mood. So we'll talk about strategies to, to kind of break this cycle. Um, and really get out of the state. So the majority of people with cancer will experience some level of fatigue. This can be during the course of active disease and self-limited to only that course, but sometimes it can last for years. So approximately 30% of patients will endure persistent fatigue for a number of years after treatment. So sometimes patients may not have fatigue at all during their active disease, and then years after, there's a good chunk of, of patients, 30%, who still have lingering effects. So that's normal, that's, that's a part of it, and, and we'll kind of discuss why. So during active treatment, the main cause of the fatigue are side effects of the drugs. So side effects of the chemotherapy, side effect of the radiation. After treatment, it's a little bit different. So after treatment, we wanna focus on three main things a person's nutritional status, their mitochondrial function, and their HPA axis function. So this slide is an overview. We'll kind of get into the specifics as we go. So as you can see, I'll flip back here again. There are many factors why someone can be fatigued and it's not, none of these above here are lack of sleep, right? The cancer patient is not tired because of lack of sleep. There's a, lot, uh, there, there's a lot more going on here, and that's why a good night's sleep sometimes is never enough. Okay, so this, this slide talks about fatigue during active treatment, and we'll start with active treatment, and then we'll go into lingering fatigue. So as we mentioned, fatigue is the most common side effect. Usually, usually it's self um, self self, uh, I'm losing my word here, but usually it's self-resolving. It resolves after treatment, but sometimes it can, can linger. 
So support while undergoing chemotherapy. So when you're in active treatment and undergoing chemotherapy and radiation therapy, targeted agents, those types of things, sleep quality and quantity is important. So we'll talk about sleep hygiene and the way to ensure that we're doing our best and hitting both parameters there. Energy conservation is something I want to talk about. So I think it's important to set realistic expectations going into, into chemotherapy and going into radiation and knowing that no matter how resilient you are as an individual, physically, emotionally, spiritual, spiritually, chemotherapy and radiation therapy do take their tolls. So preparing ahead of time, knowing that, that if, you, if you're undergoing a chemo day, radiation day, you are going to be tired and planning your, your naps accordingly so that you don't go, 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 and then crash. So being a bit proactive and scheduling rest time is, is energy conservation, an example of that. Exercise, exercise is part of the vicious cycle. When we feel more tired, we don't wanna exercise, but studies have actually shown that exercise improves fatigue levels. And then we'll talk about what specifically is a nutrient dense diet to support energy production. Okay, so sleep. Here I've underlined the benefits of sleep in terms of fatigue. So, the, the, so in terms of fatigue, having good quality and quantity of sleep normalizes blood sugar and appetite. Another side effect of, of cancer and cancer treatment is reduced appetite. So if we're feeling like we don't have an appetite, one way to improve our appetite is to get more hours of shut eye, get more sleep. The more sleep we have, the better our blood sugar balances itself and, and the better our appetite. Sleep also promotes memory, cognition, and focus and balances mood. So I mentioned the comorbidities of anxiety, depression, insomnia, those types of things. Um, insomnia is, is, is one we'll talk about in terms of sleep hygiene and, and things we can do to improve there, but um, getting sleep will, will improve um, one's state of anxiety and depression. And then of course, there's many added benefits of sleep. Hormone balance is good for the immune system, which we are, we are really um, big fans of the immune system, helps prevent our, our risk for recurrence. Okay, so in terms of insomnia, what are small things that we can do to make sure we are, we are um, getting as much quality and quantity of sleep as possible? So as always, there can be underlying factors here. Some chemotherapeutics can cause insomnia, so those have to be considered, but these are general rules. So first one is sleep hygiene. When patients can't sleep, I often ask them, is there someone snoring next to you? Is your bed comfortable? Is your room dark? Is your, are, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? So sleep hygiene are the basics that are oftentimes overlooked. Are, do you live in an area where there's sirens going off all night, where you might not be able to get into the, that REM sleep? Maybe you need ear, earbuds. So making sure we have the basics covered is one way to improve sleep quality and quantity. So seven to nine hours is also a general recommendation, but what's more important than this is sleep regularity. So making sure if you normally go to bed, say at 11 p.m., you're going to bed within an hour of that on either side every night and kind of waking up at the same time. This will help set your body's own circadian rhythm and sleep and wake cycle and can allow your body to get into a deeper sleep quicker. Wind down period before bed is really important. Avoiding devices. Blue light is emitted from devices and you can always get things such as blue light blocking glasses, but also it's better to just avoid um, these type of stimulants. And what blue light does is blue light suppresses your own, your own body's melatonin production, leading to a disturbed circadian rhythm and less, um, less quality sleep. And then most of you, I'm sure, already avoid sugar, alcohol, caffeine. Um, so that's not too, that, that's just a reminder there. But the one that, that's probably consumed the most is caffeine. And caffeine is good. Coffee has been shown to improve quality of life and many parameters in breast cancer and colorectal cancer. 
the, the key here is making sure that you're not having caffeine after 3 p.m. as that can disturb your sleep. And then making sure your digestive system gets a chance to rest. Having 12 hour fast between dinner and breakfast can also help bring your body into a deeper sleep. So, so that's, that's sleep for us and, and just some basic um, tips on how to get, get a better night's sleep. Energy conservation. So I went a little bit into this. Um, so scheduling rest and relaxation so that you have the energy for when you need it is important. We're all super superheroes in our own way, but we are not um, superheroes enough that we, we can't have crashes. Even the best of us have crashes. And when undergoing something as intense as, as active cancer treatment, it's something that um, will accompany the journey. So knowing that that's part of it, scheduling naps as needed, um, naps can be 20 to 30 minutes. And once again, similar to the caffeine, ideally before 3 p.m. Okay, nutrition. So when we talk about nutrition, we wanna be making sure that our nutrition isn't contributing more to the fatigue. So the cancer treatment is already going to wipe us out. Let's not add food in there that's also gonna contribute and compound um, to wipe us out further. So, you know, some, some patients have difficulties with appetite and are told to eat anything you, you want as, because a calorie is better than no calorie, but that's not true. If the calorie is gonna make you more tired, that's, that, that's kind of detrimental. Um, Cause you, you can only imagine the downstream effect that has. If, if the food makes you more tired, that can contribute more to the anxiety, more to the insomnia and not necessarily beneficial. So eating is important, but making sure you're getting the right foods is just as important. So avoid added sugars, um, simple sugars. So avoid things like ice cream, cane sugar, those types of things. What happens when you eat a high sugar a snack, especially when you're already in a fatigued state, your, your sugar, your blood sugar rises and your insulin also rises. Once your insulin catches up to your blood sugar, they both plummet. And this drop is what's known as the sugar crash and can, you, can leave you feeling worse off than even before you ate. So, and you can only imagine if somebody's already really tired from radiation, the, the negative effect this could have. Um, so, so making sure you're avoiding those things and sticking to whole vegetable, whole foods, any whole foods in their whole form, you can't go wrong. So I don't like patients to get too picky when, when like I said, eating is, eating is a trouble, but making sure you're eating whole foods, that's a good starting point. Digestion is also expensive. So when we talk about energy conservation, we don't want to be having, even if it's grass fed, we don't want to be having steaks three times a day because that's a very expensive and energy consuming process to digest that. So we want e easily, easy to digest foods such as soups, smoothies, blended down, boiled down, um, so that our digestive system doesn't have to expend more energy. And then everyone's an individual. You might may know your individual food sensitivities or just symptomatically what doesn't really feel good for you. So avoiding those foods, especially when you're undergoing active treatment. So this, there, there's research to support these recommendations. In 2018, a review of breast cancer patients showed a significant reduction in fatigue scores with the treatment group that was following a specific diet compared to the control group. So that specific diet that helped to reduce the level of fatigue had at least five servings of vegetables per day, two servings of fruit, one fish, and one nuts. So as we can see here, if you're eating five servings of vegetables a day, there's not really much room in there for sugary snacks. You'll be pretty satiated, as well as, as two servings of fruit, one serving of fish, et cetera. So eating, eating foods in, in, in their whole form have been shown um, in the re research to to reduce fatigue. Um, so like I said, it's part, part to do with improved satiety. If these are in digestible forms, you're not expending extra energy with your digestion. And you're also avoiding the control group in this would have had much, much poorer, poorer of a diet with 
high sugar and, and the accompanying crashes. As always, if, if you're already used to having a diet um, outlined here and you're looking for additional support, so the, the, there's a lot of antioxidants, sorry, not antioxidants, anti-inflammatory um, foods in this diet, in the vegetables, omega-3 rich things. So using supplements can also help if you already feel like your diet is, is um, on, on, top, top, on a top level. So you could use things such as curcumin, which is turmeric, omega-3 fatty acids, which is found naturally in fish, vitamin D, which is produced in your skin from the sun, and we don't get enough vitamin D living above the equator. So supplementing vitamin D can, can also help. Herbs to support, ashwagandha is an Ayurvedic ancient herb, which has been shown in cancer patients to improve fatigue levels. And then also energy production. Energy is made in our mitochondria. L-carnitine and CoQ10 are cofactors in our mitochondria. We'll talk about the mitochondria in a little bit, um, but those are also helpful to support energy production. Okay, so that's kind of active treatment. We are really making sure to remove obstacles of cure, removing the sugar, keeping moving, um, making things easy to digest. Now after treatment. So, so here we'll get into lingering effects and why good sleep might not be enough. So both the cancer itself as well as cancer treatments deplete nutrient status. In addition, most patients who are diagnosed with cancer are over the age of 30, 40, 50 years old. And over time in a North American environment, nutrient status is already depleted. So, so that can lead to the persistent fatigue. Mitochondrial function is also, um, is also an important point to consider. And then the hypothalamus and pituitary are in the brain and the adrenal glands are just above your kidneys. And these three organs communicate between each other and are responsible for our hormones, our satiety, um, our, our level of wakefulness. So, so we'll get more into all three of these and, and how they have a role on fatigue. Okay, so as I mentioned, undergoing cancer treatment, you reduce levels of iron, you reduce levels of B12, B vitamins, magnesium, vitamin D. So when we consider the first few, iron and the B, B vitamins, if a patient has an overt deficiency of these, they may be anemic. And anemia is a huge underlying factor of fatigue. So getting routine blood work to make sure that you are not anemic is important, as well as supplementing with these, with these nutrients. Digestion and absorption of nutrients may be impaired from surgery or chemotherapy. Chemotherapy strongly affects the gut. It causes a lot of gut dysbiosis, which means overgrowth of um, the bad bacteria. And this can have effects making your, your digestive tract not able to absorb nutrients properly or even absorb supplements. So, so here's where um, if, if you feel like nutrient status may be playing a role in, in your fatigue and you're not sure where to start, the first place is just getting a routine um, blood work to make sure you don't have, an, have anemia. And then after that, you can either um, supplement with, with a multivitamin, B vitamins, or you can talk to a naturopathic doctor and do some testing to see what your individual deficiencies may be. Making sure um, another basics not overlooked that we're getting the appropriate carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So according to the Health Canada guide and, and most, most guides, they say we want about 60% carbohydrates, but that can cause fatigue to um, be a bit elevated because carbohydrates um, in general have, have a higher glycemic in, index and raise our blood sugar levels and cause the sugar crashes, even if they're not simple sugars. So focusing on a diet that is equal parts carbohydrate, protein, and fat, not 60% carbohydrate and less of the others, can be beneficial. So you don't need to start the ketogenic diet by any means, but incorporating healthy fats, um, reducing the carbohydrates will be a great benefit. Okay, so we talked about how that gut bacteria could be really disturbed and how that may be impacting um, our fatigue. 
So healthy bacteria to find in the natural sources include anything fermented. So there's some examples there, kefir, kimchi, tempeh, sauerkraut. Um, and we also discussed making sure foods are easy to digest, blending them up can be helpful um, and making sure you're having at least five serving of vegetables a day. Okay, so we talked about nutrient status. Now we're on to the second point in terms of, of resistant fatigue, mitochondria. So I'm gonna be jogging your memory back, but we've all been to high school. Remember in high school when our biology teacher said, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell? Does that ring a bell for anyone? Yeah, I'm seeing a few head nods. Yep. So the mitochondria is the powerhouse of, of the cell. When we think about energy, we usually think about symptomatic energy, what makes us get out of our chair and want to go um, start the day. But at the most basic and cellular level, it is our mitochondria that produce energy and give us that symptomatic feeling of get up and go. So the mitochondria are unfortunately damaged in both chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And so if we don't, if we don't work on restoring the mitochondrial health, at the cellular level, it's going to be difficult to feel better overall. So threats to the mitochondria. Radiation therapy creates, works by creating reactive oxygen species. Um, this is a pro-oxidant effect that damages cancerous cells and it works. It's a great treatment. It's a great cancer treatment, um, but it also damages the, the mitochondria. So making sure that, that if somebody has undergone radiation therapy, that you are supporting the mitochondria and, and improving their function after treatment is definitely worth considering. Other things that, that can contribute to stress and um, damage to the mitochondria include a high sugar diet. So if you're already undergoing radiation and chemo, you don't wanna hit yourself again with a high sugar diet and again with cigarette smoking, and again with environmental chemicals. So some things we can avoid, radiation, chemotherapy, we can avoid in many circumstances, but we can avoid um, some of these things. And so, so what we can control, we will. Oh, my screen just stopped sharing. I will get that back up there. Okay. So what can improve mitochondria? We know these things are powerful. We know they're, they're responsible for our, our energy levels. Exercise can actually improve mitochondria. Um, it helps mitochondria use fat more freely as fuel and use that preferentially to glucose, which, which means if we're not having a high carbohydrate diet, our energy, or sorry, our mitochondria are still able to run. So aerobic exercise and high intensity interval training, also known as HIIT training, can improve mitochondria. So the general recommendation for cancer prevention of recurrence is 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. So this first point, um, this is 150 minutes a week. If we're doing that, so that's just walking, brisk walking, that can increase the amount of mitochondria, um, beneficially change the mitochondrial shape and facilitate repair and turnover. In addition, for an added benefit, you want to incorporate HIIT training. So as you see this lady, she can be going on a walk um, down this little hilly street. And one example of HIIT training is every time she gets to a light post, just doing either an increased brisk walk or a little sprint to the next light post and stopping. And you want to do intervals of that. So not just one um, little sprint, but intervals of 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off, 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off of a high intensity exercise followed by a rest period. Um, that that is, is what's going to, to help you improve your mitochondrial function. Okay. Exercise also has even more benefit on weight, blood sugar, appetite, digestion, the immune system. So I think this is, this is a, a point that we're all familiar with. Um, exercise is kind of better than any pill that you can take out there. 
And then clean living for mitochondrial health. As, as we talked about, one of the threats for mitochondria are environmental exposures. So this can be pesticide exposure. So making sure you're buying organic produce. Um, this can also be psychological um, stress. So if you always feel, feel stressed outside and other environmental factors um, such as cleaning products. So you wanna make sure your clean product, products, your laundry detergent, all of those things are nice and clean. So if you're familiar with the, the Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen list, this is published every year and you can Google this. So Clean 15 refers to the 15 produce items that you don't necessarily need to buy organic because they don't have a high pesticide exposure. Dirty Dozen list refers to the 12 produce items that are most heavily sprayed with, with um, pesticides and that you should always be buying organic that year. Um, drinking filtered water is important. And then also Skin Deep database. It's an app that's, that, that's helpful for looking at personal care items such as beauty products, moisturizers, seeing the level of toxicity in those products. Um, so, so we kind of talked about this. We talked about intermittent fasting, organic foods, promoting metabolic flexibility means eating a variety of, of protein, carbs, fat. Um, okay, and lastly, the HPA axis. So this, we, it, this I think is one of the most important talk, topics we'll discuss. And essentially it relates to psychological stress, physical stress as well, but most patients in the cancer population I see as psychological stress. So the experience of cancer can lead to high cortisol levels. High, so cortisol is a stress hormone. It's responsible for our fight or flight response. Um, and it, it causes inflammation, it increases blood pressure, it causes our blood glucose to get out of control, it, it disrupts our sleep and wake cycle. So having high stress is unfortunately really detrimental. We'll talk about ways to mitigate that though. Um, so symptoms of too much stress or too much cortisol include restlessness, depression, low libido, irritability, um, and then if you, if you have high stress for a long time, then you eventually get cortisol depletion, which leads to this chronic fatigue, um, muscle weakness, loss of appetite, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, if it's chronic. Okay, so, so we all know that we're, we're exposed to stress in this, in this day and age in, in North America, and especially as a cancer patient. So let's talk about what we can do about it. We talked about exercise, we talked about food, belly breathing. So just YouTubing something such as box breathing and making sure most of us breathe from our diaphragm up, making sure our inhales are going all the way down to our belly button, full inhale and full uh, exhale can really help reset our nervous system and move us from a sympathetic state, fight or flight into a parasympathetic flight. So laughter, laughter is medicine. It can't be understated. Um, chat with your friends, ask them what made them laugh today. Ask them what the, what the best part of their day was. Ask them if anything funny happened. We can't, we, we can't um, underestimate the power of laughter. Gratitude journal, really any type of jour journaling is beneficial. Meditation, mindfulness, time in nature and Reiki. So we'll talk about a few of these in more detail. Reiki specifically. So Reiki is a Japanese form of energy healing. When patients undergo Reiki sessions, they feel a release of energy sometimes. Sometimes they feel inner peace and relaxation. They feel hope. They feel they're cared for, um, improved sleep, decreased depression, improved self-confidence. So the list goes on and on and on in terms of the benefit of Reiki. There's research to support it as well. So in a study, um, that, that I was, I was research or I was looking up for this presentation. I found that 50% of patients experiencing Reiki had, a, had a reduction, a significant reduction just after one session in distress, anxiety, depression, pain, and fatigue for all patients undergoing Reiki. And this number only increased when they had further follow-up sessions. 83% of the participants enjoyed the Reiki session and found it helpful. 
74% planned on continuing Reiki and 83% would recommend it to a friend. So I've had Reiki done on myself and I'd also recommend it to a, a friend. I practice at Port Moody Health and we have our own Reiki master at our clinic. So this is something that's accessible and cannot be understated in terms of improving the HPA axis and improving fatigue and overall well-being for the cancer patients. Social connection. So unfortunately, we've been feeling a bit isolated from each other. And isolation is an independent risk factor for cancer occurrence. So even though we are isolated, it's important to make sure we schedule at least one Zoom call or phone call a week with loved ones and do whatever we can because social isolation really is in some ways as bad as smoking and it can increase the risk for cancer occurrence. And so this is the last slide here and I wanna kind of wrap it up. At the beginning, we, we talked about the American Society of Clinical Oncology, how they defined fatigue. And in terms of their recommendations, they also recommend mind-body therapies in terms of improving fatigue. So they recognize the benefit in using mindfulness-based approaches, yoga therapy, and acupuncture. So my, mindfulness-based approaches include things like Reiki. Yoga therapy cannot be under, understated. I think a lot of the benefit is the breathing there with yoga therapy. And acupuncture as well is something that we offer at the clinic and can be helpful. So I just want to give some acknowledgements of contribu con contributors for this presentation. The Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, Integrative Cancer Center, Port Moody Health, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. So thank you all for joining. I hope you each were able to write down, down something or learn something new. Um, and we'll now have question, a, a time for questions, discussion, um, and can kind of talk to each other about what we learned. So let me just stop.